Hi everybody, welcome back to Killer Content. Today we're gonna to be talking about the Butcher of Rostov. And um, I'm gonna try and go through all of this like as quickly as I can because there was so much about this man. You could read the full article on the website, killercontent.tv. Um, I super love it. I It was a really interesting person to learn about. This man is like a fucking psycho for sure. Um, but he's also been through a lot, you know what I mean? So his childhood, like, had a really large impact on him. Um, I will, if you see me glance over on my laptop, it's just because I'm making sure I have correct facts, as usual. So, I'm gonna butcher his name, and I'm probably gonna butcher a lot of names, to be honest. Um, but his name was Andre Chikatilo. I'm just gonna go with that how you say it, even though it's probably not. Um, so, that is the butcher of of Rostov. Um, he is labeled as a disorganized killer. Go figure. Um, when I talk about his killings, you'll kind of like understand why a little bit more. So he was born into a family where it was the wife and the husband and they lived in this one room hut. And they lived in this one room hut and like he grew up so poor because of Joseph Stalin had a forced agriculture plan going on and they like he provided like no wages for these people but he gave them land that they could farm on. So that's about all they really got. And so that's where he grew up. Most of the time, like, he grew up eating grass. Like, can you just imagine, like, right now, in this time period, like, being so poor, like, you at the god side and pick grass and eat it? Can't. Can't do it. Nope. I could barely eat salad. Like, no. Um, but, he said, like, that Ed, he didn't have bread until, like, the age of 12 years old. So, that was crazy. Um, he grew up with his mom and dad, you know, times are, times are rough. His mom, uh, continuously told a story of his, him saying like he had an older brother who, when he was four years old, got kidnapped by neighbors and eaten. So the neighbors are cannibals, which, you know, I'm sure sits well with a, a kid, you know, like, Hey, my brother got taken and eaten. I wonder if that'll happen to me, you know? Who knows so that's something that had a huge effect on him later on in life and you know there was no like actual record that that was true it was just something that like his mother had said a lot and honestly it, it very well can be true I have a feeling it very well is because like it was such a poor time for everyone and Eventually, in 1941, his dad got drafted into the Red Army when World War II came around, you know. And so, he was injured and later captured. And when he came back, eventually, he was labeled as a traitor of the state. So, that's cool. And while he was gone, his mother and him had to sleep together in like this, in this one room hut. And he was a bedwetter. Andre was a, like a huge bedwetter. So like anytime he wet the bed, it was, he got beaten berated by his mom constantly. Um, and then in 1943, his mom gave birth to a baby girl named Tatiana and the German were occupying, like the Nazis were occupying uh, the Ukraine at this point. So many German soldiers, soldiers were going around and like raping the local women. So it's believed that like a German soldier is the father of Tatiana just because of the fact that, you know, her husband was being held captive at this point. And then it's also believed that Andre was there when the rape happened, just because, you know, if they live in a one room hut, like what's the likelihood of him not being there? And then, 
So time goes on and then all these bombings and fires and shootings are happening. So most of the time him and his mom are having to hide inside of like cellars and ditches and things like that. And they even watched their hut burn down at one point. And I'm pretty sure the hut burned down before Tatiana was born. Um, and then they got like a different hut, I guess. I don't know, or they rebuilt it or something. And um, so, move on. The war is done. Ta-da, 1944. And Andre starts his schooling. This poor kid was so shy and so, so timid and everything else. And he just like looked weak. And in like 1946, his, the starvation was so bad because of the post-war famine that his stomach was like swollen. So he was targeted by a lot of bullies at the time and like made fun of. And at 14, he became uh, the editor of the school newspaper. And he also, what was it? Oh yeah, he was the chairman for the Pupils Communist Party Committee. He led a bunch of marches and organized them and everything else. And eventually graduated in like 1952. So joy to that. Um, he, yeah, yeah, this man, he was a very kind of like poor student and it was really hard for him. He said like he got really bad headaches and like he had like poor memory and everything else, which is like why it took him so long to graduate. Um, cause he was behind a little bit of everybody else. And while, I mean, while he was still in school and he was like 17, he had a crush on this girl named Lily, Lilia. And, but like he knew her from the school newspaper. He was too shy to actually do anything. Like he never asked her on a date or nothing. Um, but he was hanging out with his sister who was like 11 at the time and her friend. Well, homeboy apparently just decides to jump on top of her friend. And once he does, he's like wrestling her and she's trying to escape and get away from him. And this man comes in his pants. Kid you not. Like imagine that, like not just that happening, but that happening in front of your younger sister to her friend. Can just take that in for a second. And then, so anyways, he graduates. You know, obviously he's got some fucked up issues. He tries to get into Moscow University and he doesn't make it because of his grades. And like he scored really low on this test uh, compared to a bunch of other students. And, but like he swears it was because his dad's labeled a traitor. But in reality, he's just dumb. So, you know. Also, sorry if you hear any noise from my dogs. They're being weird right now. Um, so, he moved to Kursk. And he started a labor position. He enrolled in vocational school um, in, like, 1955 to become a communications technician well he was eventually drafted by the army like the soviet army and he went and he worked with kgb communications and he was in there for like three years and his work was considered like absolutely perfect i mean absolutely perfect so that was something that was really cool. Um, so he ended up doing that and they, he worked in Berlin there. He became, he moved back home afterwards. Okay, this is the fun one. So he moved back home afterwards. He became like super acquainted with this woman who was a divorcee and their relationship lasted 
three months. That oh god. Uh, so they tried to have sex several times, but he had the same problem as um this other relationship that he had in like vocational school, I believe, where like he could not get it up. Like he had an eighteen. His first relationship was like eighteen months. And they tried to have sex three times, but he couldn't, like, stay erect. And so, um, yeah, that ended. Um, and then he got into this relationship after he moved back home after the army. And the relationship lasted, like, like I said, three months. Because they tried to have sex several times. And his dick could not stay hard, like, at all. At all. It was so bad. This man had a dick problem. It was not pleasant for, I think, either party. So, uh, that relationship ended because he, um, his girlfriend went to her friends asking for advice, and they ran and blabbed their mouth, and then that person blabbed their mouth, and then the whole circle goes around. Next thing you know, all the town knows this man has a dick problem. And it's his hometown. So, he decides that he's going to up and leave because he's like, he just thinks like it was whole, his whole homeland betrayed him. And so he gets up, he moves, his sister moves with him. He moves a little north of Rostov. And he, his sister meets some guy and they go off and get married. She moves in with her in-laws and she sets him up with this lady. They get married two weeks later. It's kind of like an arranged marriage a little bit. And after they get married, this she discovers about his little issue. And she's like, oh, well, I know how we get fit. She was actually like really accepting of it. I'm not gonna lie, it was super weird. Uh, but she's like, I know how we can fix this. And what we can do is you can jack off and then take your fingers and like scoop up your semen and insert it in me. And that's how I'll get pregnant. By some miracle, this fucking worked. They had two kids together. And... Wowza, I'm so shocked it actually worked. Uh, their kids' names were Yuri, a boy, he was the youngest, and a daughter, Ludmila, I'm gonna guess is how you say it. I don't freaking know. Um, but yeah, so there's that. Um, and then he eventually attended Rostov University. He majored in Russian literature and philosophy. Phil, phil, philology. I suck at saying words today. Um, but yeah, so he majored in that, got degrees in them and everything else, and then he became a teacher. And this is when all the fucked up shit starts happening. So once he becomes a teacher, he commits his first assault, and he, in an article I read, literally said, swam towards her. Creepily, of course, you can only imagine, um, and grabbed her breast and her genitalia. And as she's trying to get away from him, he comes in his pants. I would hate to be his wife or him and like go home to his wife and have to explain why there's jizz in his pants, you know? Um, so then there's an, he commits another assault where he like locks his girl in her room, in his room and stuff in his classroom. And he didn't get like any punishment for either one of those. Don't know how. So he goes on and he goes like between all of these teaching jobs and he assaults a few more kids. And because of all of the complaints and allegations against him, his uh, career ended in March of like, I think it was 81. Yeah. March of 81. 
He committed his first murder in September. I'm 78, though. And this is where it all begins. He lured a nine-year-old girl into the woods, and he tried to rape her. But his dick, again, could just not get hard. So he strangled her and stabbed her multiple times. And as he was stabbing her, he jizzed in his pants. And then, can you just imagine, like, just explaining that? Like, honey, why is there jizz in your pants? Well, I don't know. And then just accidentally ejaculated in my pants today. Um, but... It's so funny. Uh, well, that's it, that's not funny. Obviously, killing this little girl is not funny. But like, yeah, it's pretty fucked up. Um, so she tries to say something to him, and then he strangles her again until she's unconscious and throws her body in the river. Two days later, her body is found. Now, get this. He's not convicted of this crime. There is so much evidence leading to this man. And it's like, mm, no, it was this guy. And it was a guy that, like, that's previously been convicted. And even though the police, like, even though he had an airtight alibi and everything, the police were, like, threatening his wife and, like, saying that she's going to be um, convicted of helping him and, like, this and that. And I'm like, are you serious right now? Like... And they still convicted, and he even confessed because he was under duress. And he stated that in the trial. He, like, took his confession back and was like, yo, I was under, like, extreme duress at the time. Like, they were threatening this and that. Still got convicted of it. So, fuck it, I guess. But, um, time went on, and he continued to murder more people. And, wow, it only got worse, let me tell you. Like, his second victim... He lured her into the woods, and when he did, he didn't have a knife with him, so he used a stick and his mouth to mutilate her. He ripped her nipple off with his teeth, and then just like covered her body with leaves and was like, whatever. That's just how he left. He would like gouge their eyes stuff like that like it was just bad it was just getting worse and worse so then he was arrested on like the suspicion because they like saw him going around trying to like to all these bus stations like trying to talk to women and kids and stuff like that and um so they arrested him well his blood was a type a they because they took the blood samples and everything and then his blood was a type a and then from the semen samples that were collected on some of the victims it was like his blood was supposed to be like a b or something like that i don't know i don't really know how all that forensic -y stuff works but so he got his blood drawn and his blood was drawn and it was type a so i was like yep well this can't be the guy it seems a b blah 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 let's let you go but then he got like convicted for theft of like a previous person's property like a previous employer's property so he like was sentenced to a year but only um for like only was in there for like three months and he got released he waited eight months to kill again eight months and now when he was killing this is when shit got brew freaking tall because he was he got a job, I think, with a locomotive factory. So he's trying to keep everything a little uh, low-key. And he was killing these people. And he was slashing them from their neck down to their genitalia. Pulling organs out and everything. Like, there was like a 10-year-old girl that he killed. And like, pulled her uterus out of her body. Like, what the fuck? Um, so the, the killing just got worse and worse. And, you know, it was... It could be a nine-year-old child. Um, the children, it was boy or girl, but it was mostly, like, as for adults, it was women. It wasn't men. Um, so there were, there were, of course, some boys that were murdered as well. It wasn't just that. And he started to, like, kind of substitute his, his knife for his penis. 
because he couldn't get erect and he had this dick problem. Um, so when he was stabbing them, that's when he would ejaculate. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that was freaky. Um, then they realized that, you know, like the cops eventually realized like when all these murderings were happening and like all of these bodies became discovered that he was, you know, working, he was going by railroad station because they like kept finding bodies by railroad stations. So they come up with a plan that was, boom, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put cops in every single station, like along this railway, because they realized it was along like one track. And then like the three smallest station, which it seemed like the killer freak would in the most, they put undercover cops at. So, and only undercover cops. Cause I mean, of course the other ones were both undercover and like regular cops and stuff like that. But they did that and eventually it led to the last few killings that he had, which was at one of the smaller stations. So, um, his last, his last killing, I think was a boy. Yeah. His last murder was, I think it was a 16 year old boy. Yeah. It was, no, it was a 10. Mm -hmm. A 16 year old boy. Yep. 16 year old boy. So he killed one. And then the day they found his body, he went and killed another one. And there was a cop at the, the undercover cop watching him at the station. And he saw him come out of the woods, go up to a well, wash his face, wash his hands, and be done with it. You know what I mean? Just wash it, be good. And, you know, he's like, a lot of the time, like, people were going out in the woods and, like, picking mushrooms and stuff like that. And... But he had on, like, formal clothing and everything else. And he saw, like, this red mark on his cheek and a gash. What looked like a gash in his finger. And so he went up and talked to him, got his papers. But, you know, he couldn't arrest him. Like, he, there was not, like, he didn't have, like, any kind of shred of evidence. It was just a red mark. It could have been anything. You don't know. And then he had, like, a nylon bag, too, or something. Um, so that was interesting. Um, he also performed cannibalistic rituals and, uh, like bit one of his victims noses off as well when he was killing her. Um, but this victim that he just killed, his body was found a few days later and that's the next day is when they started that, uh, following him because the, the cop remembered, oh my gosh, like this this and that and so they pulled his index card out of the system from when they had arrested him before and they're like let's follow this guy because they connected him with like the cops report and then the index card so they started following him and then one day in september i think it was september 13th yes september 13th of 1984 he was seen walking out of his house by undercover cops with a jar full of beer and then he was walking around to like all these different bus stations like trying to like lure like kids and women and stuff like that and he was seen doing this by the cops so at one point he was exiting a cafe and the police had arrested him and detained him um now once they arrested at that time they had 10 days to come up with like solid evidence and proof to take this man to trial they had tried um, a certain method of interrogation where they like made him think you're sick. Like, you know, if you get arrested, if like, if you get charged, if you just confess to us, then you won't go to jail. Like, we'll just put you in this mental institution. Cause like you're sick due to insanity and stuff, all that other crap that didn't work. Um, so then they brought in two, I think they were KGB people. But they had written a 65 page profile, like a psychological profile on the killer. They began going through reading it, just reading it to him. And about two hours in, this man broke down crying and just confessed that he was guilty. So then you know, they also took blood work and they did that. And you know, his blood was type A. 
but they also took a semen sample from him and his semen sample was AB. So it was weird. Uh, but you know, that kind of set him in as like, that's the killer, yo. And then time goes on. Uh, he confesses like, and like writes his confession down in full detail on every single murder, 52 murders. This man was convicted of. Okay. 52 went through every single one, jotting it down. Like every detail. <sighs> Nope. Imagine reading about like some man biting off a girl's nose while he's stabbing her abdomen, ejaculating in his pants. No. Couldn't do it. Could not. So, yay. Eventually, uh, you know, he goes to trial and there was a cage that was built for the courtroom. It was like courtroom number five and this cage was built to keep him protected from the families of his victims. Like not to keep people protected from him, but to protect him from them because they were so bad. The first two days of the trial was literally just reading out loud, like all of the horrible details of every murder. It was, it was just bad. And you know, eventually he was convicted of the 52, he was sentenced, he was found guilty for the 52 crimes and five assaults because he was charged for 53 and the five assaults, but they uh, only convicted him of 52 and the five assaults. And he, he had a death sentence and 86 years on top of it, which I will never understand why judges do that or anything else. Like why the fuck? Like, you're already giving him a death sentence. What do you mean you're charging 86 years? In, is his soul just supposed to stay in prison for 86 years? What the fuck? Um, so that didn't make any sense. And once he heard the verdict, he got up and, like, kicked his bench over in his little cage and everything else and flipped his lid. And then he tried to make an appeal to the death sentence that got denied in like summer of 93 and then 94 he also made an up he also put an appeal in to the president um being like yo can i just not get killed you know just spend the rest of my life in prison he's like no fuck you and um so february 13th um I think it was February 13th. It's February 13th or February 14th. February 14th of 1994. This man was taken out of his cell, brought into a soundproof room, had a gun put behind his right ear in one shot and boom, he's done. And he is now laid to rest in a prison grave um, that is unmarked. So that is Andre. If you guys want to know a little bit more detail about everything, uh, there's a huge article I could have written about this man forever. Um, on the website, killercontent.tv, please go check it out. Uh, leave a comment or like, if you like this, um, leave a comment. If you have any killers that you particularly want to know about, this is one of my favorites. Um, so yeah, this is, that's it. That's the episode for this week. Look out on the Facebook and Instagram page for killer content TV and see, try and figure out who you think the killer for next week is gonna be. Bye, stay killer.